Good evening, family and friends. Uh, my name is Julius Covington, and I'm going to be giving the midweek lesson um, for this week. So whether it's evening, morning, night, whatever time you are watching this, uh, welcome. Uh, but before we get started, let's go ahead and pray. Dear Lord, uh, thank you for this day. Thank you for this time. Thank you for just getting us up this morning, Lord, moving us about. I um, pray that you continue to watch over us, Lord, guide us. And I'm really grateful for the things that you do for us, Lord. Um, just, 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 just blessed, Lord, to be able to not take the things that you do for us for granted, Lord. And I, I pray that you continue to watch over us, Lord, and bless us. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Okay. So, the title of the midweek is Finding Faith on the Mission. Um, and by saying that, I mean that we have a mission. We're going to read here um, pretty much the entire entirety of the midweek is going to be coming out of uh, Luke 10, 11 through one. I'm sorry, Luke 10, 1 through 12. Um, but we have a mission. If we say we're Christians, we have a mission, um, which is in Matthew 28, 16 through 20. Uh, Jesus gave us a charge to go out and complete this mission and keep doing it because it never ends. It keeps going um, forever and forever. So let's go ahead and read Matthew 28, uh, 16 through 20. The title is The Great Commission. It reads, Then the eleven disciples went to Galilee, to the mountain where Jesus had told them to go. When they saw him, they worshipped him, but some doubted. Then Jesus came to them and said, all authority in heaven and on earth has been given to me. Therefore, go and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit and teaching them to obey everything I have commanded you. And surely I am with you always to the very end of the age. Now, last week, Ken talked about following instructions, and this is a deep, <laughs> deep instruction here. Uh, Jesus gives us the charge to go out and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them and teaching them to obey the, the word. Um, but I, I don't want to take it for granted that in verse 18, Jesus said all authority in heaven and on earth had been given to him. Um, when we're going to look at it here um, in, in Luke 10, 1 through 12, but we know the Old Testament and the New Testament. And we know that it was the Old Testament was the relationship between, you know, the nations and God, the, 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 the people of God and, and God himself. And then the New Testament is the relationship between the people and Jesus, which all leads up to God ultimately. But we know that that's that relationship that's in the New Testament. And Jesus came down and told us, hey, I know it's the Old Testament, not saying don't read the Old Testament, but he's saying, I know it's there. We need to read it. We need to learn from it. We need to apply it. But I'm here and I've changed things. I've given you a new way. Um, I've given you a new charge. I've given you a new mission. So go out and do it. And, and turning over to Luke 1, uh, I'm sorry, Luke 10, 1 through 12. Let's go ahead and read that. I'm going to stop on some key points throughout reading this here. So when we read this, um, within this whole scripture, within these verses, 1 through 12, we're going to hear two truths and three commands that Jesus gives us. Again, that's two truths and three commands. So the truth is the truth. We know that, that, that there's no debating it. It's, it's factual. And it's there for us to see. And the commands are him telling us to do these things. So we just read that he told us to go out and make disciples. So let's read Luke 10, verse 1 through 12. And I'm going to be stopping periodically. So feel free to pause the video and um, follow along and write down notes. And, and, and let's go ahead and get into this. So Luke 10, 1 through 12, and the title is Jesus sends out the 72. So before we even started, he's sending out the 72. So 
Let's read. After this, the Lord appointed 72 others and sent them two by two ahead of him to every town and place where he was about to go. He told them, the harvest is plentiful, but the workers are few. Ask the Lord for the, of the harvest, therefore, to send out workers into his harvest field. Go, I am sending you out like lambs among wolves. Do not take a purse or bag or sandals and do not greet anyone on the road. When you enter a house, first say peace to this house. If someone who promotes peace is there, your peace will rest on them. If not, it will return to you. Stay there eating and drinking whatever they give you for the worker deserves his wages. Do not move around from house to house. When you enter a town and are welcomed, eat what is offered to you, heal the sick who are there and tell them the kingdom of God has come near to you. But when you enter a town and are not welcomed, go into its streets and say, even the dust of your town, we wipe from our feet as a warning to you. Yet be sure of this, the kingdom of God has come near. I tell you, it will be more bearable on that day for Sodom than for the town, for that town. So after reading that, we see that Jesus sent out the 72 two by two. Um, and that this, this is, um, this is iconic because we know that the verses say, and we, we, we even practice this going out two by two and evangelizing and fellowshipping because it's, it's, it's a little bit easier. Um, it, not, not easier in the sense of getting people to come to church, but easier in the sense of relaxing and, and mellowing out and be able to connect because, um, give a strong suit example. Let's say me and Jamie are out and, and Jamie can talk to anybody, but I might be the person that can only talk to, I don't know, um, somebody that has a Gucci bag or something. I'm just giving an example. But Jamie's like, oh, I can't talk to people with Gucci bags because it gets me a little shy. And I'm like, okay, Jamie, I got this. So we'll go out and we'll evangelize. And then he'll get drawn into the conversation. And it's like, okay, well, he can talk to somebody with a Gucci bag, for example. But it's like, okay, we, we have now established that two people are better than one. So with that being said, there's one of the truths right there. Truth number one, you can write that down, that Jesus was basically telling us we cannot do it alone. This, which is why he sent them out two by two. And which is that is the, is the walk of Christianity. We can always say that, hey, you know, God knows my heart. You know, I'm going to get back up and I'm going to do this. But God also tells us, confess your sins to one another. Be there for one another. Encourage one another. Rejoice with one another. Mourn with one another. Have ups and downs with one another. Hold each other accountable. And he keeps using others. He doesn't say you do this for yourself. You hold yourself just accountable. You know, you have a speck of sawdust in your eye. You look in the mirror and you only take out your plank and your sawdust. He tells us to do that for both back and forth. So that's a truth. He wants us to do this with others, not just by ourselves. And reading here at the very beginning as well, another truth that we're going to go over here. Starting in verse two. It reads, he told them the harvest is plentiful, plentiful, but the workers are few. Ask the Lord of the harvest, therefore, to send out workers into his harvest field. We are valuable as Christians. And I'm not saying that in a boasting way that God needs us to do this. God won't do this without us. No, I'm saying that we are valuable because we are the ones that are still helping to advance God's kingdom. And by what doing this is by what Jesus told us to do, go out and make disciples of all nations. He says the workers are needed. He tells us that there is few workers. And you think you, you can sit there and think the harvest is plentiful. OK, breaking that down, the harvest is plentiful, but there are few workers. So what exactly are we getting at, Jesus, that all the Christians in the world, you mean to tell me the. X million or whatever point people, million point people, that's not enough. 
So there are few workers. I mean, just like it says, but the harvest is plentiful. Think of all the people around you that are not saved, that don't know anything about Jesus or even have a little notion of Jesus, but don't go to church or, or, or don't even pick up their Bibles and read. That's what he's talking about. The harvest is plentiful out there. It's plenty of people that even want to know God. I'm not talking about the people that don't know about God. I'm talking about the people that even want to know God. And he says they're out there, but there are few workers. There's I, I, it's runs rampant within the church. But in today's world, we have made church a spectator sport. And what I mean by that is we come in, we kind of sit down. Uh, it's like a consumer's paradise. We, we, we kind of get what we want. We try on different things. We might try on love and peace and forgiveness, but we won't try on kindness and uh, self-restraint because it's not it's, 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 it's not my cup of tea. It's uh, not what's there for me. It's not my consumer's paradise. I want to try on the things that I think will look good on me, not the things that someone else may think looks good on me. So we have done that. And, and, and by saying also a spectator sport, we come in, we sit in the stands, we sit in the pews, we, we, we like to do that and we get you know a little laxed and okay, I can do this Sunday after Sunday after Sunday after Sunday and we don't invite out, we don't encourage, we don't make midweeks, we take work more important than it is coming to church, we take work more important than it is getting up on, on Sundays or even getting off of work and just having the time to make it to midweeks and we wanna relax and think that that's okay. So we have become a, a spectator sport if we do that. We have we made church become a spectator sport if we do that. So we have to be the people that are pushing forward, um, whether it be family, friends, coworkers, any one of the likes, we have to be the people that are pushing forward wanting to help people know who Christ is. Um, I have a question for you. Knowing how the people back then were treated, the 12, um, Paul, knowing how they were treated, stoned, beaten, flogged, and they were still preaching the word. Um, it just reminds me, when, when they know that they're gonna go to a town and are hated by people, and I mean hated with, with a strong hate, these people don't even want them in their presence. That's how much they didn't like them. They were disgusted by them for being Christians. And they knew they were at risk, whether it's death, putting being put to death um, on a cross, for an example, or stoned to death or flogged or beaten. They knew what they had to do. They still went and followed what Jesus asked them to do in, um, in Matthew 28. So my question to you is, how at risk are you today with your walk with Jesus? Um, are we at high risk? Are we willing to put our lives on the line to try to help somebody become a Christian? And just help. I didn't say they're going to become a Christian. We're just helping them become a Christian. No, 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 I'm not saying we have to go out there and jump in front of buses and, and do things, you know, drastic. We're not, we, we don't have to, looking at where we're at today, versus where they were back in the day, we can just freely go out and invite people. They they had lions sicked on them. They they had crowds stoning them. They were thrown in furnaces. <laughs> they were they they had everything to their opposition, but they still went and preached and, and still went and invited and still went and asked and still went and spoke about Jesus. So where are we at today with that? Are we high risk, low risk, middle risk? Do we even take chances? Are we are we this type of people that, hey, if I can't control it, I won't do it. That's not the great mindset. We have to go out on faith and, and, and know that God's going to be with us and know that all we have to do is invite. We don't we don't change anybody's life. We can't come in and we can't water the, water the seeds and make it grow. That's God's doing. All we can do is just invite and just say, hey, I would love to see you out there. But that's why the title is Finding Faith on the mission. Where's our faith at in this? Are we testing ourselves to try to be better than we know we can be? Um, I want to give a point. I, I know a lot of us have, pretty most of us have friends, pretty much most of us have friends. Um, and it's, 
it's something when you've known somebody for, you know, X amount of years, five, 10, even 15, some, some people 20, 30, but it, it's a fine line between being friends with someone and helping them become a Christian and being friends with someone and hoping that they become a Christian. So us being Christians ourselves, we can't sit here and be friends with people in hope that they become Christians and not do anything about it. So we meet with them, we play basketball, we go out uh, to the movies or whatever we do, go-karts, paintballing, whatever you do as friends, have, you know, invited people over to play, to watch football or basketball. And we never talk to them about God, never invite them out to church. We're, 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 in, we're in a problem here. We're in a bind because we're sitting on that side of the, of the fence where we are hoping that they become Christians. And we didn't put in any invites. We didn't do anything. We didn't even listen to Matthew 28. We just said, okay, I'm a Christian. I did my, I got mine. I'm saved. I know I'm good. Hey, come over for some basketball, man. Watch some basketball. It's fine. And you never invite this person out. Or are you trying to help them become Christians? And now your life is also an example of helping them become Christians. But we have to also put in that extra mile. We have to go out. We have to invite. We have to evangelize. Because if we're not doing that, things just don't fall in our laps. So, amen. Um, I want to also here look at a command that Jesus gave us within Luke 10. Right, right there in verse 3. Looking in verse 3, he says, go. He shouts, go. I am sending you out like lambs among wolves. That is a command. And it, it, it sounds quite literal. Go, I'm sending you out like lambs among wolves. But he, he's telling us, go out. It's going to be okay. Go out. You go take the lead. And, and you go out and do these things. And prepare the way for me. Because it said he sent them out to the places that he was getting ready to go to. And you go prepare the way for me. But he's saying, hey, you might get eaten alive out here. But I'm sending someone with you. I am sending someone with you. But you might get eaten alive out here. I'm sending you out like lambs among wolves. Wolves feast on lambs. If there's no one there to protect them. They feast on them. So when we're talking about today. We can't be nervous. There's going to be people that refute every word that comes out of our mouth. Whether you can say, hey, God's going to bless you. Well, I don't need God to bless me. I can bless myself. Whoa, whoa. How do you how are you going to react to that? Are you just going to? OK, well, I'm not I'm not evangelizing anymore. Every time I run into somebody, they they shoot me down. Or you say, hey, I would like to invite you out to church. Well, I'm atheist. I don't believe in that. When we die, nothing happens. What do you do? Do you just say, oh, yeah, you're, you're, you're right. You're right. OK. Or do you say, well, I understand how you feel. I, well, I still would just want to give you a church card. If you ever change your mind, my name is Julius. My name is whatever. And, and my number's on the back. So if you ever change your mind or if you ever get want to ask any questions, I'm here. And I just want to invite you out still. Thank you and have a blessed day. We are going to be attacked. And, and Jesus said that just as he was persecuted, we will be. So with that knowledge, that's a command that God gives us. I want to look at another command. We already got the two truths down. So we have two more commands to go. I want to look at another command here right next to it. Verses four through eight. Four through eight. We're going to read it here. Luke 10, four through eight. Do not take a purse or bag or sandals. And do not greet anyone on the road. When you enter a house, first say peace to this house. If someone who promotes peace is there, your peace will rest on them. If not, it will return to you. Stay there, eating and drinking whatever they give you. For the worker deserves his wages. Do not move around from house to house. When you enter a town and are welcome, eat what is offered to you. This is another command. Not only did he tell us, go out and lead. So go. I'm throwing you out there. Two by two, like a lamb to wolves. Go. He also told us, make sure when you go, go dependent. Don't take anything. I don't need you to take your 
Honda Civic with everything in the back, your, all your camping needs. I don't need you to do that. Just go. I don't need you to take anything that makes you feel comfortable. Just go. Go do it. This is us learning dependence on God. We are saying, hey, God, I know you sent me out. I need to go out. I need to lead. I need to go dependently. And I'm kind of relying on the people here. If I'm if I meet a town, if I if I get a house here or if I, you know, some if somebody welcomes me in, I eat, I drink whatever they give me. I'm just going out and I'm just doing what you ask me to do. Amen. Another command that he gives us in Luke nine. Let's read that one right next right a verse down. In Luke nine. It reads, I'm sorry, Luke 10, verse nine. It reads, heal the sick who are there and tell them the kingdom of God has come near to you. So with that being said, we have to go out expecting. Jesus commands us to go out expecting. He didn't say when you get there, if there are sick. He said, heal the sick who are there and tell them the kingdom of God has come near to you. He's telling you there will be things that are going to come up when you get there or when you evangelize or when you run into somebody who is wanting to hear the word. When you run into somebody who said, I've been looking for a church, you have to be expecting that. It can't shock you. You can't say, oh, well, I want to invite you out. Oh, you, you, you were looking for a church. You wanted to come to church? I, did, I didn't know. I didn't. I didn't know that's what you wanted to do. No, we have to be expecting that. When they say, hey, I want to invite you out to church. Here's a card. My name's Julius. Oh, I've been looking for a church. Where do you go? Well, let me tell you about it. You can't be shocked by it because that's a command he gives us. Go out expecting. I want to read Ephesians 3, verse 20 through 21. Ephesians 3, verse 20 through 21. Now to him who is able to do immeasurably more than all we ask or imagine, according to his power, that is at work within us, to him be glory in the church and in Christ Jesus throughout all generations forever and ever. Amen. We have to know, we have to know that God can do anything when it comes to us, whether it comes to us even being getting out of our comfort zone, whether it comes to us evangelizing, whether it comes to us uh, saying, OK, I need to get out of the house and go to an event or do something and, 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 and spread the word. We have to know that God's going to be there for us. We have to be able to imagine that he can do anything, not even imagine, believe it says here in verse 20, he can do immeasurably more than we ask or imagine. So I can imagine a lot. <laughs> I, I can imagine what I would do with winning the lotto, what I would do with X amount of money or even a house or anything. I can imagine a lot, but I know that I have to say God will do even more than that. All I have to simply do is believe in him. And, and he's at work within us. That's the second part of that verse 20 here. According to his power that is at work within us. This is God's power at work within us. We have to know, we have to be confident that God will do anything. Amen. Um, last verse here I want to read. I want us to go to Luke 10, 17 through 20. Back to Luke. Luke 10, 17 through 20. The 72 returned with joy and said, Lord, even the demons submit to us in your name. He replied, I saw Satan fall like lightning from heaven. And I have given you authority to trample on snakes and scorpions and to overcome all the power of the enemy. Nothing will harm you. However, do not rejoice that the spirits submit to you, but rejoice that your names are written in heaven. He says, do not rejoice that the spirits submit to you or that you can trample on snakes or scorpions. 
Rejoice that your names are written in heaven. We cannot, and I'll say that again, we cannot get caught up in what's happening. We can't. We need to instead look at who is making it happen. And that's God. We can't get caught up in what's happening. We can't say, okay, I invited this person out. They become a Christian. Now their mother became a Christian and their son became a Christian or father. And this was because of me, because I invited this one person out. We can't do that. We can't say, you know, hey, I was able to um, evangelize with an atheist today and it went really well. He's going to come out the church. And I did that. Can't happen. Even if we don't even put the focus on ourselves, we can't say that, oh, that that worked out great, you know, because we can't get caught up on what's happening. We have to say that, you know, all glory be to God here. Thank you, God. Thank you that you even gave me the ability to go out. Thank you that you even put it on this person's heart to seek you. Because as we read before, that you have to be enabled to even get to Jesus. So thank you for putting on this person's heart that they can seek you out, God. Thank you for, you know, focusing on on getting things in line. And all I had to do was just go out and open my mouth. I made nothing happen. God, you made it all happen. We cannot get caught up on what's happening. Just who's making it happen. Amen. So with that being said, I'm grateful that... Um, I was able to speak to us about finding faith on a mission, on the mission, not a mission, on the mission, finding faith on the mission. Uh, because as we read in Matthew 28, we have to go out and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and the Son and of the Holy Spirit and teaching them to obey everything. So when we get baptized and we become Christian, it does not stop with us. It, we cannot have that mentality of, I made it, hooray, I'm good and I'm all set, because it doesn't stop with us. We have to go out and keep inviting out and keep helping build God's kingdom. Amen. And to God be the glory. Let us pray. Dear Lord, thank you again for everything you do. I pray that you just continue to watch over us, Lord. I pray that you continue to bring people our way who really want to hear your word. And Lord, if we go out and we evangelize, I pray that we don't get discouraged. I pray that we keep moving forward. I pray that we knock the dust off our feet and go to the next person and the next person and the next person and not expect anything to happen with it. But Lord, we should be going out expecting. And I pray that you do everything and we do not take any glory for anything or any credit. Just give you all the honor and the glory. In Jesus name we pray. Amen.